Welcome to Marin Poets Live. I'm Nishama Franklin. I work at the Fairfax Library and I love poetry. After this program airs on TV, it will appear on the Marin Free Library website as part of a digital archive which also features biographies of the poets and links to our collection. Today, we feature poet Yvonne Postel. Hello, Yvonne. Hello. So glad to have you here. Thank you. And as we do, a Marin poem, if you please. A Marin poem. Ponds of West Marin. Just west of here, our vastness of continent ends at time-wasted cliffs buffeted by winds and storms. Perched on those cliffs are hundred-year-old farms with ponds where cows kneel down and drink unharmed. I like to think of farm kids 90 years ago, throwing off salty shirts when chores were done, diving and swimming the safety of those ponds while ocean roared its warning of coming wars. That's what I think happiness mostly is, to swim a sun-warmed pond with a reachable shore, while the world, held at a distance by muscular hills, sings on the voice of the wind of its coming ills. Mm. The secret of happiness. <laughs> it's wonderful to have that in a poem and in a very first poem. <laughs> Another, please. This also has a Marin connection because the inspiration came from Marin. It's called Ode to a Turkey Vulture. So you can see it's not exclusive to Marin, but this one is. Ode to a Turkey Vulture. To see you day after yellow day gliding the blue air above my canyon is to understand. You, too, got a bum rap. Some universal trickster cobbled such beauty and ugliness together, the human eye won't trust itself to praise or damn. Made certain by design, what's elegant in flight is ugly on the ground. And is it fair that people with beautiful words lying everywhere Ascribe you the grisly name you wear? It's true, I would not take you for a pet. Would not have you roost within my walls or hear your great wings sweep my bric-a-brac with a clatter of breakage to the floor. Yet, sitting here with morning tea and toast, sheltered by a gazebo from the sun, my gaze sweeps up and I love you floating by, majestic in your acreage of sky. If when I die, there should be no loved one near, having no creed, I bequeath last rites to you. Swoop down, surround, and strip my white bones clean. Scatter them on some outcropped stone so the sun, finding them at dawn, can nuzzle them through lazy afternoons until darkness and earth's dews descend to bathe my bones the way rain cleanses trees, the way mists soften downed wood on the ground. If when I die there should be no loved one near, Sweep down, cleanse me, make my flesh air. Mm. I, I love it because it, it kind of encapsulates death, which is both, you know, kind of a release, a soaring, and then something ugly and lumpy, you know, all in the same body. Mm. <laughs> I, you know, and I never thought of that bifurcated image, you know, that, that, that up in the, uh, of course, I must have thought of it, but you made it, you brought it into consciousness. And I, I will never look at a turkey vulture the same. They're wonderful creatures. Yeah. They're wonderful. 
I'm going to read a, f a few uh, poems from my first book, which sonnets for Sarah's daughters. Uh, my my uh, grandmother was named Sarah, and she had five daughters, mm. and uh, they were very close together, the, the five daughters. I spent many happy summers driving some of the sisters back to Oklahoma to spend a summer oh. with the other sisters, and uh, so I honored them with my mm. first book. But this one is uh, not about the sisters, but it's called Oklahoma Preschool. Before I learned to read, I learned to work. Following in my parents' cotton rows, a canvas picking sack upon my back. No one gave kids and fields a second, a second thought. My father weighed my sack, wrote down the pounds, and day by day my tally mounted up. By end of season, I had picked enough to buy a coat. They took me into town. It was a penny store, as I recall. Rack upon rack in childish shades of wool. I looked upon my choices, took my pick. Pink piped in white and with a matching hat. Mama cut the tags. I put it on. The power of money coursed within my veins. Still sang there when the coat had been outgrown. Mm. Now, just clarify for me, was this actually you or was this one of Sarah's daughters? This was actually me. Wow. Me. I was born in Oklahoma yeah. and lived there until I was eight years old. Ah. And uh, uh, it had a great influence. It shaped oh, me. Yeah. It shaped That's me. That's very, very good yes, that yeah. we have that um, grounding there. And, and then the opening up in California oh, yes. is a very rich mix. Yes, I, I, I was very excited to come to California. I'm still excited mm. to come to California. Uh, uh, slivers of soap. Wet palms coax perfumed lather from their alligator sides, and I wash my face with the bones of bath bars others would discard. Friends smile. My family assigns a motive to my penchant for using things up. The penuries of my youth. But they miss the point. When life has worn me thin and brittle as this soap, may someone need me still until I break in the hand or dissolve in a fragrant act of comfort or delight. Mm. I love the elegy built into these poems because when you get to be as old as you are, as I am, it's always out there. It's always and, out there. Uh, and you might as well greet it rather than hiding, yes. because it's, it's working inside you anyway. Yes. <laughs> and that's what you're doing here, wonderfully. This uh, next poem is called Beautiful Daughter, and it's for my daughter, Lisan. You stroll beside me, telling me a story, not noticing the heads that quickly turn, as if to catch a glimpse of some rare light. I see them. Glances that once caressed my face when we walk side by side, now cling to you. A moon eclipsed, I've grown into invisibility. Were you another woman, I'd be jealous. But I watch your ascent with quiet pride. As beautiful as dragonflies at play, with passion brought, Every word you say, you draw admiring eyes unconsciously and help me cross the bridge from youth to age. When all eyes turned from me, they flew to you. Mm -hmm. That's such transmission. Transmission. Yes. Mm. 
I love hiking. I love the, that's one of the things I love about Marin, but I also love that over in the East Bay when I lived there. And Emily Dickinson's Steak, which is the next poem I'm going to read, uh, grew out of a hike. We meet up on a, mid, a warm mid-August day when each comes solitary to the trail. Both frightened, I stand rock still. It flees, a startled streak of terror. Then it stops. Fearful, yet curious, reluctant to obtrude upon another creature's solitude, we pause and watch each other for a sign. The light upon the trail, tilted and slant, glows like yellow glass held up to sun. She has described this meeting perfectly. Armed with her description, I move on. How does the snake resolve its beating heart, incorporate the terror, and resume? What I loved about that is I had no idea what the creature was till you <laughs> named it. So there's a great uh, building mystery. Oh, I didn't real. I didn't think of that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the last one that I will read from that book is Tap Dancing in the Kitchen. Mm -hmm. I tap dance in my dream. The snow comes in and floats in flurrying swirls into the pots atop a crowded stove where I stir broth and cook sweet onions in a buttery froth. My feet have sprouted feathers at the heels. I dance in circles tending to my friends and tending to a fragrant harvest feast. Rich talk floats up like snowfall in reverse. Above the swirling flakes, I glimpse the sky, brittle as ice and radiant with stars. As I dance back and forth, I smile and nod and listen for your keys turn in the lock. I love the domesticity of that poem. And oh, that would our holidays be like that? Would they have that quality? Often for me, you know, it's loaded with family intensities. But that's the purity. That's what we all want in holiday. And you've got, it's kind of the essence, the broth of holiday, yeah. I think. Well, it's a dream, you see. Oh, all, all right. <laughs> I, I tap dance. Sure. I, tap, I tap dance in my dream. Yes, it's yes, lovely. Yes. Yes, and, and again, using, using domesticity as the springboard yes. just makes yeah. me feel so at, literally at home. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to switch now Please. to poems from my most recent book, After Beauty. I wrote this book in the two years after my late husband died in uh, 2009. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it, it's both a memorial to him and a record of our 19-year love affair, love, love, and, uh, and then as he diminished his, his death and my recovery after that. Mm -hmm. So I, I start the book with a section called Prelude uh, because I felt that one had to understand what kind of love we had to understand the rest of the poems. Yes. So. Uh, this one is called Let Love Be Written Down. There are things that can last a millennium. Glass shards, bones of ancient creatures, bees and sap. Love can barely last the lifetime of the man or woman living it. Though when they touch hands pulse with pleasure, love will die when last beloved breathes last sigh, even if that breath is loved one's name. Inhabiting a fragile human frame, love can't outlast the body's finite span. So touch me, soft and often, while we can. Mm. 
But of course, it lasts in that poem. So that's, that's why it's, um, it's let, a paradoxical poem. And that's why it says, let love be written down. Exactly. <laughs> right. And it, it has a very classical feel, almost a little Keatsian. Oh. You know, just that's the way it hits me uh -huh. right now. I Lovely. like it. I like it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and the next one, easy love. By the time we met, we had learned to love our lives. So mutual love was effortless and strong. It fit the hand like a sun-warmed stone chosen from a creek bed of water-dappled stones. So easily we could have missed it, distracted by trout leaping in pooled water. Not heavy, not rough or jagged, smooth as only Water and time can shape a thing. No longer seeking perfection. Perfection. Mm. Oh, that's, I would like to kind of, there are things I kind of want in my kitchen on a sampler and no longer seeking perfection, perfection. Thank you very much. You're because, <laughs> because again, it's just wonderful paradox. Yeah and very, very sweet. And then there are these lines in here that are just so classic poetry, you know, that um, um, I, I don't know, I can't pull it out, but it just goes bong, 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 the song of poetry. Yes. That's very I lovely. love the iambic uh, yes. foot and, and find myself falling into that a lot. Yes. Yeah. And I'll uh, move into a more somber phase of the book, this poem is called Waiting. With one elbow on the mantel, death smokes a cigarette, and eyes half closed clocks every cocktail we consume. More accurately, it watches you, in spite of having switched from Jameson's to ginger ale, you continue to waste away. At 90 pounds, you should be easy pickings. Why is it taking so long, you ask? Caught up in watching your wary pas de deux, at first I fail to see reflected on the wall one of death's many shadows. Equally attentive, that shadow taps its toe, sucks its teeth, keeps its eye on me. Mm. And, you know, Baron Samadhi and all those figures of death. I mean, you got him there with the posture and the cigarette, you know, uh, um, in, kind of implacable and, and, and louche a little wild. <laughs> yeah. You know, what is, this, what is this doing in my room? <laughs> in our lives. In our lives, yes. exactly. Yeah. The room of our lives. Yeah. This poem, After Beauty, is the title poem from which the book was named. One by one, the rose turns loose its petals. They lie, bruised thumbprints on the table. Yet fragrance keeps the place where the petals were. When beauty dies, the heart of a thing goes on. When the body dies, memory of the beloved grows strong. Mm, that's a bouquet of thought. I, th I mean, it should be on a card for condolence mm, mm, because it's mm. lovely. I'm <laughs> marketing you, but this is beautiful stuff. Um, I'll just say maybe six minutes, so okay. choose what you'd like. All right. Uh, I'll do two more from, from this and then maybe a, a quick... Okay. Um, Widowhood, it's two words, widowhood. Let the widow not wear a black hood. Give her instead a leather helmet with a clear visor that snaps into place. Behind the faceplate, let her breath be shallow. In this way, separate her from the world. Are we dead, you ask? when you were still alive, but in that yellowed weather of the slowly dying. 
Now I turn a visored gaze to assess these citizens into whose country I somehow have blundered. Are we alive? And if alive, who am I? Yeah, when part of you dies, it's how do you embrace life again? Yeah. Which is the big challenge, which obviously you have. <laughs> And the last one from this book is called mm -hmm. Souvenir. Uh, we used to go to New York in October, and uh, the last time before he died that I was there, he did not go. I brought him leaves from Central Park because we love to walk Central mm -hmm. Park. So, Souvenir. The leaves I brought you from Central Park still retain Falls Russet. Their scalloped edges crisp against the marble pedestal of the Brancusi sculpture. They remind me of our October trips, two white-haired seniors strolling hand in hand through the park's northern reaches. With you, I saw your city as for the first time, while you savored recalling that early life the way all hard times should be remembered. Dappled sun on the path ahead, Obligations met, money to spare, two-way love traveling through loosely twined fingers. Mm. That's exquisite. So, um, New York met Oklahoma. Oh, yes, and, yes, uh, and yes. And what a pairing that must have been. What a pairing. It, it, was, a, yes. it was a lovely happenstance, I yes. must say. Yes, lovely, we have lovely. time for another poem. And right. I keep, I want them coming. <laughs> All right, let's see what I'm going to do. I know that that had a beautiful ending for what we're doing here, but we want more poetry. <laughs> well, I'll do a, um, I'll do in honor of my mother, uh, cheating at solitaire. Adapt the rules, she said. When you come to the place in the game where you've run out of place, flip the cards as you deal so the top card ends face up. To this day, I still play by her rules, <laughs> though always with a prickle of concern, like running a stop sign when you know it's safe, but knowing safe is not the same as legal. Uh -huh. Of course, mom's point was more than a rule for cards. First loss, she taught me, need not end the game. When a venture comes to an ending, you can give in or invent for yourself new rules to extend the play. And that's exactly what you've done in your life. That's just my um, husband, when he played as a kid, cards with his old grandma used to see the cards reflected in her glasses. <laughs> that's how he cheated us with Midwestern <laughs> stuff. So, I'll be careful when I play with my granddaughter. You better be careful. <laughs> yes. Um, do you have a tiny one? A, a tiny, tiny one? poem? You let's know, let's I, end with one short one. I, 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 I'm glad that I have time for it because it's Good. kind of a benediction. <sighs> All right. Go as ceaselessly as the sea. Go as ceaselessly as the sea with equally measured motion and do not yearn for the safety of shore once you are outside the harbor. The sea moves from Hokkaido to Mendocino and never once stops to check the chart, to read the stars, to ask the distance left to travel. So you're sending us on a journey with you and it's been an absolute joy, Yvonne Postel. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me, and you're welcome. I'm happy to share my poetry with you. Yes. <laughs>